John, why don't we turn now to you, to John Palfrey. How did you get into privacy? Your class, Jonathan, Internet and Society, maybe 1999. Those and were good when, times. <laughs> <laughs> even back then, so you started with, this is yet another privacy uh, conference, yes. but I think even in um, the late 90s, you were saying, this is yet another class on privacy with respect to cyberspace. Oddly, you've always seemed bored by the topic and yet always come up with more and more insights uh, into it over time um, and John seem to return to the it. the art of, was that a compliment or an insult? <laughs> I just don't know. Total compliment and also fun. <laughs> um, uh, so it was it was by you and actually the, the struggle in a way of um, what to say at another privacy conference is made easy, I think, um, by the continued insights that you have. The idea of generativity itself, um, I think, builds on that. And every time you learn something new about cyberspace, you create new problems in privacy, um, which I think is partly why we're back here. As we build more and more of this built space or design more of it, um, we come up with new and um, more intriguing problems. And I don't think we've solved yet the design problem of how to live a balanced life as between public and private in a cyber environment, um, and it seems to me that's sort of core to what's here, and huge credit to Judith and Jeff Long for pulling together this wonderful interdisciplinary group um, to, to talk about it. Um, and you said earlier what was the punchline of the joke. Um, lawyers are usually the punchline of the joke, right? So you've left us for last, so I guess we're the punchline. Um, but I think the reason that we're also engaged in this and interested in this is that lawyers on some level are also designers of spaces. I think that we like to hang out with Jeff Huang and Laurent and others because we perceive that we are designers of institutions and rule sets and so forth that make these spaces not just have low thresholds but also have uh, inviting uh, environments where we can thrive right over periods of time. And again, I think privacy is one place where we as lawyers haven't done a great job yet in determining what that rule set um, ought to be like. I wanted to hit three points that I think grab somewhat what Paul and Laurent have been saying, um, but maybe also throw some things forward to some later sessions. Um, the first is the, the importance, I think, of the, um, the human experience in, uh, in this uh, space. And uh, Dana Boyd, I think, is the great expert on this and will be hitting it later. Um, I think her basic insight that we are um, public by default and private through effort or private by design is a very important one in this, uh, in this environment. Um, also key to that, the work that um, Dana's been doing, but lots of us also in um, uh, in focus groups and interviews and so forth, learning from people, both young people and older people, um, that baby back there and up through the oldest person in the room, that in fact, um, while I think many of us have the initial instinct that people don't care that much about privacy in this space, um, that simply isn't true, that I think we're learning much more as we live in this space that though we often trade convenience for control, we very often give information about ourselves out. You've always pointed out in that class way back then, the CVS card or the Shaw's card that you get 30 cents off the, um, uh, the butter, even though that might uh, later make your insurance rates go up and so forth. We do it anyway, um, that we care about it in particular contexts and trying to understand that human behavior um, is I think crucial to the story. And I I think that's in, in part um, where, where Paul started us, started us off with. Um, and that's a changing set of practices. Um, Worse and I are now doing focus groups with kids again um, after three or four years uh, of a hiatus from it and hearing them talk about privacy in um, ways that they clearly, at least in this tiny sample, um, are more thoughtful about it. I think we are coming to greater and greater recognitions about the kinds of trade-offs that we're making. And yet, even in understanding these trade-offs, not making great decisions, not necessarily yet having the handholds or the tools um, or the means to give expression to the things that people want as uh, our sort of desires in terms of what to keep private and from whom and what context. And again, I want to throw this forward to Dana, who I'm sure will talk more about um, that set of trade-offs later. Um, the second one, I think, is sort of a classic lawyer's problem that we've dealt with for hundreds of years, which is the, um, the intersection between the public and the private. We've debated this in many respects. The sort of obvious debates over this are the design of how the Fourth Amendment works, for instance, and its analogs around the world. The basic question of when somebody, ideally in this case the state, wants to get information about you, what are the rule sets that say you can under these circumstances by getting this kind of a warrant in this kind of a way? And the extent to which in this environment things like the Fourth Amendment haven't been 
been good tools for us because of the blurring of what is public and private and also the extent to which when things are in private hands, in other words, they're held by a private player like a Facebook, the same rules don't apply. This is called the um, third party uh, exception or third party doctrine. There are lots of ways in which our old um, designs of these spaces fit the rule system relatively well, but in this new environment, this much more blurry environment, um, those rules don't work as well. And we haven't yet done the hard work to reimagine how those protections and those kinds of trade-offs ought to get played out, particularly in a space where so much of the time it's private actors who control what are the public spaces. And I'm sure we'll continue to talk about that theme. And then the third one, I think, is just to, um, to reflect on the, the basic um, notion of the systems that we've built for the internet and social media and other things um, uh, that go on top of it. And sticking with the Gowalla and Foursquare and Scavenger example of the kind of check-in applications, um, I think the systems that tend to work best are ones that are highly interoperable with one another, right? So we don't want to have to type in to five different systems my status update. I am in MD, Maxwell Dwork, in G115 at you know, pound hyperpublic sitting next to um, at Ethan Z, right? You want to type that once and have that broadcast into a whole lot of different systems um, so that if Jenny Toomey is on Gowalla and Dana Boyd is on, you know, Scavenger, they'll all see the same thing. And the systems that are most highly interoperable, have the most open APIs, have the most apps, those are the ones that succeed. Android passing, you know, the iPhone now with the number of uh, installs and so forth. So we uh, favor that most highly interoperable of systems as a design matter. And we think of that as good for innovation, consumer choice, competition, all these things. And yet that itself is one thing that gives rise to the problems of privacy in this environment, right? The extent to which we favor these things that do broadcast or, um, uh, as you would say, promiscuous publication of this information across lots of platforms then leads to information seeping out of different contexts, the contexts that um, Dana and others say are so important. So as a design matter, getting back to these images, an image that came to my mind is the image of a break wall. The idea that sometimes what we need to have in these um, systems between open systems is places where, for, as between a uh, harbor, a safe harbor, and then a you know crashing sea, we need places that the data can either be slowed or stopped in instances in which you actually want safe harbors for the data that sometimes may be able to connect to the crashing sea but may not, or places for the ships to pass and so forth. I don't think we've been as good about figuring out what do the break walls look like in these systems as we rush toward a highly interoperable system for reasons that are good. The innovation and generativity and so forth are good things, but I think we're now realizing the need to put up, and maybe speed bumps to use a Charlie Nesson phrase is another way to think about it, but ways that the, um, the data flow um, in ways that give the user much more control about when they go from one context to the other. And I think that lots of the business models and lots of the kinds of public policy approaches have favored you know, more data in more people's hands to throw more ads at it, to have more innovation, to spend more venture capital in it, to get more IPOs and so forth, right? Yeah. That's been the, the cycle. So um, to me, it's as lawyers coming back in along with designers and others and saying, no, we haven't quite gotten this yes. balance right, and how do we do that? It's funny because it feels like you've, you've basically given Lorentz talk a second pass because you're talking all about thresholds. And the ways in which, I think implicit in Lawrence's talk was the way in which breaking down thresholds tends to be good. Not entirely, not complete open space, but I, don't, I think I maybe, this is me being a lawyer, perhaps no. I'm misrepresenting what Lawrence says. I, I didn't say, uh, my argument was not about if it's good or not, it was first, uh, first of all a, a kind of uh, overview yes. of what, it, what is yes. happening. Yeah, but I look at that Seattle Public Library and I say what makes it so interesting is that it has really played with thresholds and lowered them, right? I mean, yeah, but there are the other examples, exactly like the airport, which is uh, just an incredible. The uh, Seattle airport? No, uh, uh, Seattle, the, the conventional airport. Oh, an airport. Uh, an airport as a, as a. Where uh, thresholds and boundaries are extremely important. Extremely important. I yes. Mean. That's the total recall uh, yeah. image you had. Yeah. But it was, I, I was trying to say something as a normative matter rather than a descriptive one, which yes. is to say the descriptive matter is, yes, we have lowered walls, and I think in some sense we favor lower walls. The Berkman Center itself favors low walls to have more people participate in our work or for yes. us to learn more from others, yes. right, as an example. Or, again, you're building you know, the next Goala or um, Foursquare. Yes. You want low walls. But I think that there are costs yes. to permanently low yes. walls, ones that are eliminated, and I think we have to think about how we yes. um, work with that. To be able to just say one tweet and have it hit all platforms, arrested, 
as the person in Egypt did right. when he was arrested that then managed to have a lot of dominoes fall on his behalf. But then if you say something and want to take it back, it can be awfully hard to do uh, or to selectively release it. It maybe calls to mind back to Urs's opening example <coughs> of Google Street View, which of course is also a great mix of the technological and the architectural, the yeah. landscape architectural, and our notions of private and public. And while it's only on the public street, you can imagine people would feel differently about Street View if it came up your front walk and dropped off a pamphlet and at the same time filmed its trip up your front. That's going too trespass, far. Trespass, clearly That's my it's trespass. Front walk. Right. Um, no solicitors if you have a camera. But I then see it being taken to the next step uh, in a hypothetical that I heard from Charlie Nesson prior to 1999. Charlie's been into live streaming since before there were streams. He's streaming you right now, watch out. I, you know what, I think Charlie actually is relaxed because he's like, nah, someone else is streaming it at this point. <laughs> <laughs> it's, someone else has it covered. But there was a time when Charlie, if not actually doing it, which he did, oh, yep, there, there's his uh, recorder. Um, he aspired to a world in which basically he could wear a hat and instead of it having twin uh, cans of beer with straws coming into it, his hat has two <laughs> recording devices. Yeah, no, I wasn't going there. <laughs> two recording devices and a camera and a microphone. And just as he walks around, you can, you know, you can ride along with Charlie's homunculus. Like, that's the program. And see the world he sees. And he almost sees it as freedom of mind to be able to choose to do that as a person. But of course, we connect that up with what you were just talking about in your interop uh, zone, and you see a world in which that can be made interoperable and part of a market, so that I can say, gee, I was curious who was going in and out of Maxwell Dworkin today, and there's some query I can shape which immediately goes across the database of people like Charlie who've been live streaming and figures out for the past 30 days who was in front of Maxwell Dorkin with a decent view of the door, more or less, and then give me an account of everything that was going on across all of their freedoms to have recorded it. And that seems profoundly weird to me. That makes the, can Google film my front walk, seem like a somewhat small problem <laughs> next to the world we are building interoperably uh, among ourselves. I don't know if you have reactions to Amen. that. I didn't end that with a question mark. No. I, I think you said it, as uh, usual, the teacher better than I could, the well, student. You're very kind, fellow teacher.